I can't let you go without talking about Titanic being the biggest selling film score album in the history of film score a albums. Did, did you have a sense of that when you started to write these, these melodies? Jim and I had worked together a couple of times, and I've known Jim since his very beginning. He, we both wanted a score that was very real, that was non-orchestral for the most part, even though there were big sinking scenes that needed a more conventional approach because there's, these are conventional ideas. If you go too much off the beaten track, you lose an audience. So you always have to sort of balance slightly when the big ship is sinking or when it goes under the water. There's a certain drama that has to be brought out with a big orchestra. But for the more reflective moments, and actually two-thirds of it, a lot of it is electronic or ethnic instruments or this soloist that I use, Sissel, um, to be like a ghost commenting. And when I first saw this movie, it was 36 hours long. I saw a rough assembly, and he was still shooting. Titanic. It took me, yeah, and it took me three days <laughs> to see it all. But you knew right away. It's just like from the first half hour, you knew what you were seeing. No special effects in it at all. And I went home that night, and I think all the themes came to me in like really like the course of 20 minutes. I had it all nailed. It was nothing mystical. It was just I, I just knew what he wanted. And I played them for him. We met the next day. He went to Baja that afternoon. And from there on, it was just waiting for the movie to be edited and release dates to be organized, which of course ended up being a big deal. And the way the whole song at the end happened was never into we were never going to put a song in um it was going to be and jim insisted it was going to be some orchestral cue of the film and i had been very careful in writing the score to scale it in such a way and to make it more and more intimate as you go through the end of the film at the end of the movie i didn't think i could serve the emotions that i had unleashed by having a, a, a symphony a, a noble or a violin section or, a, an, or an orchestra play a closing credit sequence. I just didn't think there was anything emotionally left in that. I needed something much more intimate and was a, the distillation of that was having a single human voice sing, which was this woman, um, Celine, and I've known Celine for quite a while and I played her my idea for it, but it was a cinematic decision and the whole song stuff happened after that. It was always, it had its song form in the film, but it's quite simple in the film. And the lyrics for the, uh, for the, the song itself the all lyrics, came later. The lyrics, the song idea, I had lyrics written on the sly by uh, Will Jennings. The song, I went to um, Las Vegas to see Celine, and we, she wanted to do the demo of the song all clandestinely <laughs> so that no one would know because if any word got out that there may be a song every music supervisor and every songwriter would be oh there's going to be a song well yeah, they're not going to be a part of the song we'll use and yeah and jim cameron didn't have any idea there was going to be a song and i got it all together very quietly put it on a dat and um it sounded great and it was what i wanted for the end for the closing of the movie over the credits after the last cue of the film it's so magical and sort of mystical the whole ending of the movie and um i waited till he was in a really good mood <laughs> i kept it literally every time how long we, did you have to wait we we <laughs> would meet every we would meet every day and a half or two days for me to play music or talk about new sequences that he was doing special effects we were very intimate together on that film and he had just shown me this great sequence, and he was very proud of it, which is the sequence where Rose, as an old lady, is talking, and the camera sort of goes past her, and she goes out of focus, and you go under the bow of Titanic underwater, and the camera starts moving up the bow. You're out of the ship, and you're in underwater, and as it moves up, you go into color and present day in this big thing at Southampton. It was unbelievable, this morph, morphing sequence. I remember it. I was, and he obviously loved it, and it was stunning. And we were just looking, we looked at it about four or five times, and um, he was in a great mood. And I said, I have something to play you. <laughs> and we went around the corner to his stereo system, and 
play the song. So the idea that it would be on the pop radio station to become this big hit was... Totally beside the point. It had nothing to do with anything I was interested in. To me, it was a distillation of what the film was about and where audiences' heads were at that point in the movie. The fact that it became more contemporary as the song unrolls, I think, is in keeping with the audience, in keeping with the general nature of the film and what Jim and I were trying to do. Well, the new movie is called Enemy at the Gates, composer James Horner. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Pleasure.